Now that we've finished going through the key disorders of amino acid metabolism, let's transition to the normal physiology of the regulation of carbohydrate metabolism. Insulin and glucagon are the two major hormones that regulate the synthesis of glycogen in the fed and unfed states. Let's go through the mechanism of each. In the unfed state, synthesis of glucagon and epinephrine is driven by low blood glucose. Both of these hormones cause activation of the enzyme adenyl cyclase, which synthesizes cyclic AMP, which in turn activates protein kinase A. A kinase phosphorylates its substrate, and in this case, protein kinase A phosphorylates the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which is also a kinase. Glycogen phosphorylase kinase can then phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase, which also activates it. The role of glycogen phosphorylase is to break down glycogen into glucose via a process called glycogenolysis, which increases blood glucose to address the fact that you're in an unfed or hypoglycemic state. On the other hand, insulin is secreted from pancreatic beta cells in the fed state when glucose is high. It activates a receptor tyrosine kinase, which causes it to dimerize, and then sets off an intracellular signaling cascade that results in the activation of two protein phosphatases. These dephosphorylate both glycogen phosphorylase kinase and glycogen phosphorylase, causing both to become inactive. Consequently, glycogenolysis does not occur, so glucose remains stored inside cells to prevent hyperglycemia. A third pathway occurs in muscle, in which calcium and calmodulin can activate phosphorylase kinase. This coordinates glycogenolysis with muscle activity, ensuring that enough glucose is present to make ATP. Some general rules are that glucagon and epinephrine result in phosphorylation of enzymes, whereas insulin results in dephosphorylation. So we just talked about how glycogenolysis is regulated, but let's go over what actually happens in both glycogen synthesis and glycogenolysis. Glycogen is essentially a polymer of glucose, in which branches are connected by 1,6 bonds, and linkages have 1,4 bonds. This means that most of the glucose molecules are connected between the 1 and 4 position, whereas the branches are connected between the 1 and 6 position. As you can see, if you keep connecting via 1-4 linkages, you end up with a straight line, whereas the 1-6 linkages come off at an angle. In skeletal muscle, glycogen undergoes glycogenolysis to provide glucose, and therefore ATP, to be used during exercise. In the liver, glycogenolysis is not used to increase glucose locally, but to maintain blood glucose, and therefore the energy supply for the whole body. This diagram demonstrates the mechanism of glycogen synthesis and degradation. First, glucose 6-phosphate is converted to glucose 1-phosphate by the enzyme phosphoglucomutase. Glucose 1-phosphate can then be converted to UDP glucose using the enzyme UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. UDP glucose is the substrate for glycogen synthase, which synthesizes glycogen by adding UDP glucose to the end of a glycogen chain. Glycogen synthase is activated by glucose 6-phosphate, since if you have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate, you might as well store it as glycogen. Once the chain has grown to about 10 glucoses long, branching enzyme is used to move some of them back to form a 1,6 bond with the previous glucose, creating a branch. So those first three steps are involved in glycogen synthesis. Next, we'll talk about breaking it down. Glycogen phosphorylase, whose function is shown here, adds a phosphate group to a glucose molecule, which separates it from the glycogen chain. That's the same glycogen phosphorylase we talked about in this last slide, which regulates glycogenolysis. By the way, this requires cofactor vitamin B6. This can sequentially break down 1,4 linkages in the glycogen chain until they get to a length of about 4 glucoses left. This 4 glucose structure is called a limit dextrin, and glycogen phosphorylase can't break it down any further. To solve this problem, debranching enzyme is used to move all of the branch except for 1 glucose to the end of the chain, which allows glycogen phosphorylase to resume its function. This diagram shows the synthesis and degradation of glycogen in a different way. Again, you can see that glucose 6 phosphate is converted to glucose 1 phosphate, and then UDP glucose. With the help of glycogen synthase and branching enzyme, this is used to make glycogen. Then, both glycogen phosphorylase and debranching enzyme are used to convert it back into glucose. Now, glycogen can also be degraded in lysosomes. This requires the enzyme lysosomal alpha 1,4 glucosidase, which is also known as acid maltase. As its name suggests, this can only break apart 1,4 linkages. It's important to know the pathways of glycogen synthesis and degradation so that you can appreciate disorders of glycogen metabolism. The glycogen storage diseases are caused by abnormal glycogen metabolism, which can cause damage by allowing glycogen to accumulate to toxic levels inside cells. There are 12 types, but we'll just review the four most common ones. Type 1 glycogen storage disease, or von Gierke's disease, is caused by deficiency of glucose 6-phosphatase. Remember, glucose 6-phosphatase converts glucose 6-phosphate into glucose, so that it can leave the cell and travel to other parts of the body. Also, since glucose 6-phosphate activates glycogen synthase, if it is allowed to accumulate, then more glycogen will be formed. This is why patients with von Gierke's disease can have severe fasting hypoglycemia, since they can't export glucose from the liver, and have excess glycogen in the liver, since the glucose 6-phosphate is activating glycogen synthase.
This also causes increased blood lactate, which can lead to gout due to increased urine pH, and can cause hepatomegaly or hepatosteatosis. Some other effects include renal failure, delayed puberty, and hepatic adenomas. In general, it might help you to remember that von Guericke's disease affects the liver and the kidneys. Type 2 glycogen storage disease, or Pompe's disease, is caused by deficiency in lysosomal alpha-1,4 glucosidase. As I mentioned before, this enzyme breaks down glycogen into glucose in the lysosome. This is a very serious disease that mostly affects the heart, the liver, and the muscle. Findings include progressive muscle weakness, breathing and feeding difficulties, hyporeflexia or areflexia due to glycogen accumulation in spinal motor neurons, and cardiomegaly, which can cause congestive heart failure and restrictive cardiomyopathy, which in some cases can be deadly within the first two years of life. The third type of glycogen storage disease, known as Cori's disease, is caused by deficiency of debranching enzyme. Remember, debranching enzyme is required to break down glycogen into glucose. This primarily affects liver and muscle, and has findings similar to type 1, but without the lactic acidosis. Again, these symptoms include hepatomegaly, hypoglycemia, and delayed growth. The hypoglycemia is more mild in Cori's disease than it is in von Guericke's disease, and symptoms in general are more benign. That's because Cori's disease does not affect gluconeogenesis, which is impaired in von Guericke's disease since glucose is trapped in the liver as glucose 6-phosphate. Lastly, type 5 glycogen storage disease, or McArdle's disease, is caused by a deficiency of skeletal muscle glycogen phosphorylase. Consequently, this only really affects skeletal muscle and not cardiac muscle. You'll see increased glycogen in muscle with an inability to break it down. Since muscles can't get enough glucose from breaking down glycogen, this can cause muscle cramps, myoglobinuria, and muscle weakness with strenuous exercise. Lysosomes are organelles whose main function is to break down unwanted molecules using a variety of enzymes. The deficiency of one of these enzymes can cause a lysosomal storage disease, which results in the accumulation of a sphingolipid or mucopolysaccharide in certain cell types. These diseases mostly affect children and are often deadly at a young age. They're all autosomal recessive except for Fabry's disease and Hunter's syndrome, which are both X-linked recessive. You'll probably get a question in your step one that asks you to identify the specific disease, deficient enzyme, accumulated substrate, or clinical findings that result from one of these lysosomal storage disorders. To get these questions right, you should take some time to memorize this table and pay particular attention to what distinguishes these from each other. As usual, we've provided some mnemonics that can help you remember these. For example, to remember that Neiman Pick results from a deficiency in sphingomyelinase, you can use the mnemonic, no man picks his nose with his finger. This diagram can help you visualize where each deficiency lies in relation to others in the pathway. But while this may be helpful for organizing these in your mind, you don't have to memorize it for your exam. Reading through all of these from beginning to end will result in a lot of it going in one ear and out the other. I recommend that you try to memorize these in a methodical manner, such as by making sure you're familiar with each disease before moving on to the next one, and going back to review the ones you've already learned after you go through each subsequent one, so that by the time you get to the end of the list, you'll have gone through the ones at the beginning a few times already. Returning to these often to quiz yourself might be helpful as well. To learn the findings, focus on the distinguishing characteristics of each disease. Fabry's is notable for the angiokeratomas, Goucher's for bone necrosis, and metachromatic leukodystrophy for ataxia. Neiman Pick and Tay Sachs both have cherry red spots on the macula, but Neiman Pick's has hepatosplenomegaly, whereas Tay Sachs does not. Hurler's and Hunter's syndrome also both have a lot in common, such as a flattened bridge of the nose and a prominent forehead, but Hurler's is notable for corneal clouding, while that's not present in Hunter's.